I I think it's very correct. Let's get started with CE414 and our last topic lecture of the semester. Um, all right, a couple announcements. Attendance grades are up to date. Um, the, uh, the homework, I will admit, is a little bit behind. 6.3 to 6.6 .6 are still being graded. Uh, I'll just send my TA a, a reminder. Now, 6.7 is due today. Your final assignment, 6.8, uh, is due, um, or is assigned today due Wednesday. And then uh, I'm having it due Wednesday because I'll have the solution posted on Friday, and then we are done with homework in CE414. Other than the bonus assignment, which if you haven't done it, please do it. Uh, again, if there's any suggestions or input in regards to improving the class in the future, I really would appreciate it because um, I kind of want to um, always ensure that I'm delivering uh, the goods, as it were. If there's uh, anything that you think should be improved, you let me know. Okay, we need to talk about our final topic of the semester, which is the topic of local buckling. And um, what this is going to do is tie together columns and beams. So they're both going to be sort of wrapped into this topic. Um, and it's going to shed some light on some, uh, I guess, notes and, and, and issues in the spec. And I think hopefully you might get a little bit of a bigger picture on, on how things work on some advanced steel design topics uh, after this lecture. Okay, So I want to begin by going back to this. Okay, so this solid blue curve is the flexural buckling curve for columns, okay? Now, the way this works is we take the slenderness of the column, the KL over R, or the way the spec indicates it, LC over R, uh, and we say, okay, we compare that against 4.71 square root of E over FY, and we say, okay, um, if this slenderness is less than this limit, we have an inelastic buckling expression. And if it's greater than, we have an elastic buckling expression. So there's two ranges for columns. And there's a single anchor point that delineates whether we're in inelastic buckling land or elastic buckling land. For beams, there's a little bit more going on. Um, but the process is somewhat similar. In other words, that we have this uh, unbraced segment of the beam and then we compare that against our two anchor points to figure out what zone we're in. And then that zone tells us how to compute the capacity. And so we have three zones for, um, for, for beams. We have either a full plastic zone, an inelastic LTB zone, or a plastic, or, an, or sorry, or an elastic LTB zone. And we have expressions to compute them. Very plug and chug, very straightforward. Um, but these assumption or these expressions are making a, a generic assumption that we kind of want to break down today. And what those two curves are showing you, uh, or what they are assuming, I should say, is that local buckling is not a concern. Okay, I want to say that again. What those two models are assuming is that local buckling is not a concern. And so the obvious question is, well, Dr. Mike, what the heck are you talking about? What is local buckling? Well, let's talk about local buckling. The easiest way to describe local buckling is with a picture. Okay, so this is a picture. Okay, um, what we have here on the very right is a column that is experiencing global buckling. Okay, global buckling is what I think we are all familiar with. Okay, now uh, with global buckling, what happens is the entire cross section translates or, or deforms, resulting and an overall curvature of the cross section. Okay, that's global buckling. Local buckling is different. Local buckling is instead of the entire cross section deforming or buckling, maybe only uh, a single component of that cross section is deforming. In other words, it's not the entire column that buckles, it's just the flange that buckles, or it's just the web that buckles. That would be local buckling, okay? Now, there are some examples of this in the real world. Here's a, a, a series of beams framing into this uh, uh, column. And you can see, if you look at the image, you can see the flanges are sort of giving up. But it's not the whole cross-section. It's just the flanges. All right, everybody see that? 
All right. So what are we assuming with this curve here and this curve here? We are assuming that this local buckling effect is not going to happen. Okay. Um, but it is very much a possible concern. Now, the way that we handle local buckling uh, is we have to classify the cross section and basically ascertain for the given shape whether or not uh, local buckling is going to be a concern based on its uh, aspect ratio. And, and when we're talking about steel and we're talking about uh, uh, cross sections that are made of various plate components, what we're looking at essentially is width to thickness ratios. Okay. <laughs> So we're looking at the comparison between how wide a given plate element is versus how thick it is. And if you think about the, the, the dimensions, think about width to thickness ratios. What would the dimension of a width to thickness ratio be? It would be unitless, right? Very akin to an L over R, right? L over R being the slenderness of a given column or a given beam or what have you. So I propose that if L over R is a slenderness measurement, of a given column or a given beam, then width to thickness ratios are a measurement of the slenderness of a given element of that cross section, a given flange, a given web, a given uh, et cetera. All right? And what we do is we basically look at the cross sections and we ask ourselves, what are the stresses required to buckle the cross section? Okay? And so what we do is we take the stress required to buckle the cross section. We set it equal to some sort of limit, usually equal to the yield stress, and we say, okay, what is the B over T ratio required to prevent local buckling? Okay. To give you an example, this is some work that I did actually as part of my PhD dissertation. So what I was trying to do was I was looking at a particular type of uh, steel uh, tub girder that was bent using a large capacity press brake, and so what we were doing is I was looking at the cross section and I was saying, okay, what moments would cause the flange to buckle or the web to buckle as opposed to the entire thing? And so I did a lot of finite strip analyses looking at that. What I found was a worst case scenario right here. And so I found that this distortional buckling mode would occur at a moment of around 1.52 or about 52% higher than the yield moment. But it ended up not being something to concern yourself with because if I bend the beam, well, I'm going to like hit the yield moment before I hit this moment. Okay. And in fact, this particular moment value was larger than not just MY, was larger than MP for this given cross section. So we found that for these uh, given girders, local buckling was not a concern. Um, but I needed to do this for this problem because the cross section was geometrically a bit complicated. Okay, I needed to break out the, uh, the um, real deal structural analysis tools. Uh, uh, and, and whenever you're presented with a problem uh, like this where you, know, you don't have a nice pretty closed form solution to compare to, that's when you break out things like finite elements like abacus or FE map or something like that uh, in order to uh, assess its behavior. But fortunately for most uh, everyday steel design, some of this stuff has already been figured out. Okay, And so let me explain how the code deals with it. The first thing that the code does is it differentiates between two different types of plate elements that you would find in a given girder. Okay, And we call those stiffened elements, and we call those unstiffened elements. So what is the difference between a stiffened element and an unstiffened element? A stiffened element is one that is supported on both edges. So like the web of an eye shape, that would be a stiffened element. Okay, An unstiffened element would be an element that's supported only on one edge. Okay, And the element that's supported on one edge would be like the outstanding component of a flange. So if you think about stiffened elements, stiffened elements would be webs of eye sections, it might be webs of channels, unstiffened elements might be flanges, might be angle legs, stems of T-sections, etc. With me so far? For each of these we can compute a width to thickness ratio. So for example in the case of the web we're not taking D over TW, we're taking H over TW and H is the height from where the web becomes flat to the web becomes flat. Okay, So we take H over TW. For the flange 
We don't take the width of the flange divided by the thickness. We take half of the width divided by the thickness because we're looking at this outstanding element here. And so what we need are these two quantities here, BF over 2TF and H over TW. Well, by golly gosh gee, if you open up table 1-1 and look at the page on the right, you will find those values listed right there. Okay, So we have our slenderness, uh, uh, our, our width to thickness ratios already figured out. They're called compact section criteria in table 1-1. Okay, uh, Now what we do is we compare these to specified limits. Okay. Now, AISC contains some separate classifications for columns and beams. Let me go back to the beginning here. Remember, columns have two zones. It's either inelastic or elastic, and beams have three zones. Well, it's the same thing with local buckling uh, classification. For columns, we have two classifications. We either have elements that are non-slender or elements that are slender. Okay. So, uh, and basically what we're doing is we're calculating a single limit and seeing whether or not the slenderness is less than that limit or greater than that limit. Uh, in other words, if, if you want a picture to try and go along with this, we're trying to figure out whether the eye shape looks like this or it looks like this. Now, all things being equal, let's assume, just for the sake of discussion, that both of these shapes had the same moment of inertia, had the same cross-sectional area, therefore had the same radius of gyration. It would stand to reason that if the R value is the same for both of them, then all things being equal, they would have the same capacity. But that doesn't make sense if you think about it from a local buckling perspective. From a local buckling perspective, I would think that this section is weaker, right? Because it's the, the element, that it's thinner, right? So that's what this is doing, is it's checking that thinness of the, uh, of the flanges in the web. Now for, uh, for columns, there are two limits. For beams, there are three limits. Okay? For beams, again, there's a lambda P, a lambda R, and we check our cross-sectional elements to see what classification we fall under. And we have three designations, compact, non-compact, or slender. Okay? Um, and compact, non-compact, and slender uh, will define the stockiness or the flimsiness of your flange in your web. Now, you can find these on table 16.1-16. I want everybody to turn to that in your AISC 15th edition steel construction manual right now. Okay. Now what you'll find when you open this table okay. 16, 16.1-16. This is in spec. Yeah, 16.1, remember that's where the spec is. And I think it's on 16. Now, there's two tables, okay? And I want to make sure everybody's paying attention to this. So there's two tables. There's table B41A and B41B. Table B41A, with the thickness ratios, members subjected to axial compression. B41B, members subjected to flexure, okay? So if you're looking at columns, we need to look at, obviously, B41A. If we're looking at beams, we need to look at B41B. Now, for the sake of discussion, let's just consider B41A. All right, look at the very, very left. Okay, see these two groups? We have one to four and five to nine. What are the difference in those groups? You have your manual in front of you. <clears throat> unstiffened and unstiffened. So, unstiffened elements, we're going to consider flanges of rolled eye shapes, da 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 da, shape one. We compare our width to thickness ratio against this 0 0.56 times the square root of E over FY. Remember I told you that square root of E over FY was going to pop up, right? Okay. Stiffened elements. We go right here. Look about case five. Webs of doubly symmetric rolled and built up I-shaped sections and channels right here. Okay. Now, there's our case for columns. This is our case for beams. So what we're going to do, I, I think the easiest way to go through this process is to just look at a given example. I want to classify a W14 by 99. I want to classify that and see um, how it behaves according to local buckling in both compression and flexure. And what I'm going to show you here in a bit is what happens when one of your sections violates uh, 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 compactness criteria. I'll show you that here in a bit. I'm not going to make you do that on an exam, 
but I kind of want to just walk through it with you. Okay, so we're looking at a W14 by 99. All right, so here's the W14 by 99. Let's look at two quantities. And we use lambdas for these in bridge engineering land. So we'll call it lambda F. And let's look at lambda W. Now, to be clear, you do not need to compute these. They are reported for you. You just need to look it up. So what is the width to thickness ratio for a flange and a web for a W14 by 99? 9.34. And this one is? 26.5. All right. OK. All right, so now that you've got that, let's go back to table 16 point, or to page 16.1-16, and let's start doing our classification, okay? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to classify according to compression. Okay. And so let's underline that. So what that means is we're first off, we're going to look at this shape, assuming that it's a column. And if it's a column, let's see how it's going to behave. So we're going to look at the flange first. Okay. So the flange, we know that BF over 2TF is 9.34. So now I want to go to table B41A. So maybe I'll put this up here. And I want to ask myself, what is the limiting slenderness ratio, the limiting, the limiting width to thickness ratio, I guess I should say, for a flange? of an eye shape. So this is a flange, which means it's an unstiffened element. So maybe I'll put that right here. I'll say unstiffened. No, no, okay, so that's great. Okay, so B over T is what you're comparing against, in which case that's this. So what's the limit? There we go. 0.56 E over Fy, which in this case is 0.56 square root of 29,000 over 50 KSI, which is what? It's like I'm making you break out your Casio FX 115ES plus or similar scientific calculators. Thirteen point forty nine. Okay. So, everybody with me so far? Now pay attention up here. I, want, uh, I need I need the thinking caps on. Let's look at this number, BF over 2TF. This is a measure of slenderness. So the bigger that value goes up, the more slender it is, right? So the bigger this number is, the weaker the flange. Okay? Now this is, that's what this is saying. The bigger this number is, the weaker the flange. This is the limiting value, okay? So what I'm going to say is that 
since BF to TF is less than lambda RF, I'm going to say the flange is compact. In other words, this is a beefy enough flange that I propose that local buckling will not be a problem. Does that make sense? So on the flip side, if I had a BF over 2TF of 20, that would be a pretty slender flange compared to this limit. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? Do you, does that make sense? Okay. And for columns, it's either compact or slender. There's no three ranges. Okay. So this is one of my classifications right there. All right. Now what about the web? The web is stiffened. Now, H over TW, again, is 23.5. And we are going to compare against a slenderness limit for the web. What is that going to be? One point four nine square root of E over F Y. Can somebody just tell me what that is? I mean, because it's going to be one point four nine times square root of twenty nine thousand over fifty. So you can probably take your previous calculation, just go up in the history and change the number or change the constant coefficient at the end. Thirty five point eight eight. So is our web compact or slender? Hold on. Let's think about this. This is the slenderness measurement of the web, and this is the limit. It's compact. This is a compact web. Okay, so H over TW less than lambda RW, so the web is also compact. So, bless you. What this means, this is what this means. Because the section is compact under compression, it means that all those equations that I used uh, for columns, you know, the 0 0.658 raised to the Fy over Fe, all that, those still work. Now, if one of these is slender, it does not mean that if I put a feather on top of the column that it explodes. That's not what it means. It just means there's a different way of computing the capacity, and I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. But for now, let's look at beams. So now we're going to classify... according to flexor. And so now we're going to look at table B41B. Okay. Now for the flange, we've got a little bit more going on. Okay, so we've got BF 2TF is 9.34, okay? Now, this table is a little bit more complicated, right? Everybody see that? There are two limits, right? There's like, there, there's two for a given case. Does everybody see that? What are the two? Okay, all right. Now, what are the expressions? Well, I, I'm talking about the four. Point three six. Yeah. Square root of E over Fy, and this one's 1 1.0 square root of E over Fy, right? Now, you said lambda P and lambda R, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call those lambda PF, lambda RF. 
Now, somebody help me out with these. I, you know, I think you find that actually the calculations are pretty, like, are pretty plug and chug. So what do we get for PF? Nine point one five. What about for RF? Twenty-four point oh eight. So if I was to say this as if it was zones, would this flange be in zone one, zone two, or zone three? Two, right? It's in the middle. Okay, so we don't call them zone one, zone two, and zone three for flanges. We say compact, non-compact, slender. So what I'm going to say is that since lambda PF is less than BF over 2TF, which is less than lambda RF, I'm going to say that the flange is non-compact. That's what I'm going to say for this. OK? All right. Now let's talk about the web. So H over TW, again, that was um, uh, 23.5. Now. We're going to need a lambda PW. Let's do lambda PW. What is that going to be? 3.76 square root of E over FY. What is that? Pretty large. Pretty large. 90.55. Do I need to calculate um, uh, lambda r? No, why? There you go, yeah. So h over tw is um, less than lambda pw. So the web is compact. So those, so if you're wondering what the classifications are, if you're wanting the summary, here's the summary. And so you can say flange is compact under compression. Web is compact under compression, and then flange is non compact under flexure or bending, whichever you want to say, and then web is compact under flexure. That's the answer. Would it being non-compact suggest that it's just more likely to experience local buckling or? Um, I'm going to answer that. I'm going to answer that here in a sec. But let me, let me take care of the classification first, and I'll show you what that means. All right. Before we talk about how this affects capacity, is everybody okay with the classifications? Now, let me answer your question a little bit more directly. So the question was, does, if it's non-compact or slender, does it mean that local buckling is a consideration? Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. 
What it means it ultimately <clears throat> is that the equations and the spec that we've been using is not enough. Okay, I'm going to show you like very explicitly how it would affect a given problem. Okay, I'm going to show you that here in a second. All right, but before we show you that, I want to again, everybody good with this? Uh oh, what I do? Oh, did I on this slide? Oh, that's supposed to be greater than. That's supposed to be greater than. Whoops. I'll fix that. You're 100% right. That's supposed to be greater than. I will fix that. Okay. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. Let me pull out my, my mouse here because I'm going to, I want everybody to follow along with me on this. Okay, I want everybody to turn to this. Design of members for compression. 16.1-33. Okay? This is the chapter that deals with columns. Okay? I want to show you something because we, we haven't really talked about this, and so this is, I think, a good place to talk about it. Now I want to look at this user's note right here. This is a user's note that tells me the application of given sections in chapter E um, dependent upon the type of cross-section that I'm looking at. Now, if you look down below, you're going to find oodles and oodles of different cross-sections like tubes and, and square tubes and T's and angles and all sorts of different things. And there are different sections in the manual. So it's saying section E3, section E4, and it has these limit states. Let, let's talk about that. And specifically, what I want to focus on is the first row. I want to talk about eye shapes. It doesn't really matter what shape you focus on. I think the, you'll glean the same educational knowledge at the end, but you, you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's say we're dealing with this type of cross-section, which is you know, what we've been dealing with uh, a fair amount uh, with columns. Now, what we have here is two row, or two groups. We have sections without slender elements and sections with slender elements. Now, up until now, we've been dealing with sections that do not have slender elements. So we've been using either section 3 or section, e, or section E3 or E4. We haven't talked about E4, so I'm going to bring that up here in a little bit. But if the section does have slender elements, we use section E7. So let's take a look at some of these sections. Let's start off with section E3. So I'm going to skip ahead one page. And here's section E3. Okay, now, oh, goodness. I went way for too far ahead. Sorry. That scroll got away from me. Okay, so here's section E3. Okay, something you all should see right there. Now, if you look at section E3, this is the section. This is the model that we use to compute the capacity according to section E3. That looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? That is what we've been using this whole time. All right? We've been saying when your KL over R is less than or equal to this, this is your capacity. When your KL over R is greater than this, this is your capacity. Right? That's what we've been using this whole time. Now, this model assumes that the elements are compact. I will tell you that every problem that we've done up until now, we've never had a section that had slender elements. Never. Okay? If you look at table uh, 4-1 that had the WH, the W10s, the W12s, the W14s, the vast majority of all those sections are compact. Okay, But every now and then, you might have a section that's non-compact. And so we're going to talk about what happens there. Now, what happens if you have a slender section? You just use a different section of the spec. Now, um, just to give a very, very um, brief discussion of E4, E4 never governs for sections that are doubly symmetric. So we've never looked at it for W shapes. But section E4 considers what happens instead of the columns buckling in and out if they buckle by twisting. Like you load it and it twists and fails. And that happens with singly symmetric sections with angles and things like that. And it's just plug and chug expressions. It's not hard, it's just plug and chug. But what I want to focus on is E7. So let me, let me look at E7. Okay, so E7 starts on page 16.1-42. 
So let's turn to that. So this would be the section that we use uh, if you have a column that does have slender elements. And what the, the code is basically saying is that what we're going to do is we're going to compute the capacity as FCR times this new area. Okay, so FCR is the critical stress. It's done the same way as we did it before. So we use the same model, but what we end up using is a different area. The idea is that if you have a slender uh, web or a, a slender flange, then some of that flange is not effective in holding up the load. So we sort of subtract out the buckled portion of the web and say that's our capacity. And I'll show you how that works here in a second. Now we're going to skip section E71 because that's, uh, or sorry, no, um, then we're going to focus on section E71 because that's slender element members excluding round HSS. There's a specific spec for them. But the idea is that you look at the, the element um, that is uh, slender, be it the flange or the web, and you compute a new width of that element. You either say it's B or it's this reduced B. And all this stuff that it's computing is very plug and chug. There's very plug and chug expressions on, on how to do that. And so I'm going to walk you through how that works with a given uh, quick example problem. And I've pasted this um, in your class notebook, but I'm going to use this because it's a little easier to see. Okay, so let's make this a little bigger. Uh, let's do that. That's good enough. Okay, so I want to compute the capacity of a W21 by 44, but we're going to compute it assuming it's in compression. Okay, and to be clear, it is very common in steel frame structures that you have elements that are experiencing both compression and bending. And so even if you have an element that's primarily a beam, it might also be experiencing compression. And so while a W21 by 44 would most often be used as a beam, if it was a beam in a moment frame, uh, it very uh, possibly could experience compression. Okay, So let's assume that it's 10 foot long, and let's assume that it's uh, pinned on both ends. Okay, So we're keeping the boundary condition stuff simple. All right. So the relevant section properties are right here. Okay, So we have the gross area, the web thickness, the uh, BF over 2TF, the H over TW, and then RX and RY. Okay. Now, the first thing that we do is we do what we just did for a column. right? So we compare the BF over 2TF compared to the lambda RF, the H over TW to the lambda RW. And what we find is that we have a compact flange, but we have a slender web. Okay. So the web's slender. All right. So ultimately what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to compute, I don't know if my pen's going to work on this, uh, well, it won't, I'll put it over here. Okay. So ultimately what we're going to have to compute, because the section is slender, is we're going to have to compute FCR times AE. Okay. Now FCR is computed the same way as before, right? We compute our KL over R, we compute our FE, we can compute 4.71 squared of E over FY, we compare KL over, R, KL over R to this, we use the inelastic buckling expression, and we get that. that that's no different, okay? That's no different, okay? Um, what we, now what we have to do is we have to compute this effective net area. And so let me explain how the effective net area works, okay? So here's the column. Now this column has a slender web. So what I'm going to propose is that loading this in compression, the web is going to buckle. Okay? And specifically what I'm what I'm going to say is here's the column and I'm going to assume that I can only count on the shaded area to withstand the capacity and that this part in the middle is ineffective and so that shaded area is what I'm going to try and compute which is a E. Okay. So in other words, I'm able to use the same stress as before. I just got to back off the area a little bit because the columns, not all of the column is effective because some of it's buckled. 
All right. So all I do, and what would be valuable is to follow along in the manual is with what I'm doing. Okay. So in the manual, I'm going to, to table E71, and I'm saying, okay, let's look at the manual. So it lists uh, in table E71, which is uh, on the top of 16.1-43, I need to determine a C1 and a C2, and I've got those right here, right? So C1 and C2 are 0 0.18 and 1.31. We need to determine the associated width to thickness ratios, which we've already got that figured out. We know that lambda is for the section and lambda r is what I just computed. Uh, and so all I have to do is compute a few base values. I need the actual height of the web. They actually don't report that in the manual, so I just take the h over tw ratio times the thickness, so I get the actual height of the web. So this is the actual height of the web, and then ultimately what I need to figure out is how much of that height is reduced. Um, and you can see what I did there. So in order to compute the reduce or the effective height of the web, I compute FEL, very plug and chug. You can probably see it there on page 16.1-42. Uh, very plug and chug. I take C2 times lambda R over R squared times FY. Plug and chug, I get that. And then I compute my HE. In this case, the manual is calling it BE. It's calling it effective width. But in, in this instance, what I'm interested in is the change in height of the web, right? So the web is 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 going down a bit. Now, um, what I then need to do is I need to compute the area of the column, and this is the part I kind of want to walk you through a little bit. So here's the column. Okay, and ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to remove that buckled portion from the column, right? So if this dimension here, if this dimension is H, what is this dimension right here? It's H minus the effective width, right? Because the idea is that this is the total height, and everything that's not shaded is HE, the effective height. So that's the difference. So my effective area of the column is just the gross area minus that buckled portion. And then what I do, I take that, I plug it into phi PN, phi FY AE in this case, and I get that value. And you don't have to believe me on this. If you go to, there's a table in, in section six, table six two, you go to page 657, a W21 by 44, that's 10 foot long, has a capacity of 294 kits. So it, it matches what the, the manual is computing uh, as well. Does that make sense? The, the point I'm making is I don't want you to think that, um, that the capacity, like, like if you fail local buckling, that um, you put a feather on the column and it explodes. The column's still usable, it's just it's going to have a, a, an adjusted capacity. Now, how much capacity got reduced? Well, we can actually walk through that right now. Okay, phi F critical AE is 294.3 kips. I'm curious, what is phi F critical AG? Let's assume that we ignored all this local buckling stuff. What is that? So it's 0 0.9. Um, 25.76, and then the gross area is 18.76, or sorry, 13.0 square inches. What is that? So this, so just to be clear, this considers. local buckling. What about if we ignore local buckling? What's the capacity? 301.4. So, so, there's a couple points to be made about this. Considering local buckling doesn't have a big impact on column capacity. Like it really doesn't, right? I mean, 
if I ignore local buckling, I get 301 kits as capacity. But if I consider it, yeah, my capacity is going to go down a little bit, but not a lot. But can that decrease in capacity be enough to make the difference? Well, what if I put 300 kips on this column? It buckles. It fails, right? So do I need to consider it? Yes. Okay. It's not hard. There's just a different flow chart. If you go to chapter F, the chapter on beams, yeah, it's a little longer. Here's the similar flow chart, right? And so here we go, right? We have an I-beam where they're both compact and yielding an LTB. What if we have an I-beam where the flange is non-compact or slender, right? Boom. We use section F3, right? What if you have a compact or non-compact web, right? Compact, non-compact, or slender flange. We use section F4. It's not harder. I mean, it's longer. I will fully admit that it's longer. And there's different limit states that you need to check. We need to check, so for instance, we have lateral torsional buckling. We have flange local buckling, so the bu local buckling of the flange. Compression flange yielding, tension flange yielding, and so on and so forth. It's not harder. It's just more limit states that we need to check. It's just more math, very spreadsheetable, very plug and chug. I mean, honestly, that, that problem that I just posted, we had never done it before. It's not hard. It's just got to go through and chug it out. So any questions? Are we just doing the simple classification? Yeah. I'm just having you do the classification. That's all I'm having you do. As long as you can classify it, I'm happy. Any questions? So what are we doing in class for Wednesday? Nothing. Nothing. What are we doing in class for Friday? Which means come prepared, ready for questions. That's all I've got. I will see you on Friday. Or sorry, uh, uh, yeah, on Friday.